What's the name of your autobiography? Of my autobiography? Um, fast, cheap, and easy. It's what you, you are what you eat. Wow, wow, wow. Um, as I was saying to a friend today, I believe mine is loose and unstable. Okay. Uh, as my joints have been described throughout my entire life as both loose and unstable. Floating joints? Not quite that, but not far off. Hmm. Like like my the ligaments in my joints are like really just not doing their job very well. You know, weird. Got a lot of excess uh, uh, ligamenture. I don't even think that's a word. I just made it up. Sure. I don't give a fuck. It's a weird. It's a weird thing to have. It's a weird flex, but okay. Okay. What would be the What would be the topics of your autobiography? The topics of my autobiography. Oh, um, would you just tell your life story and then somehow have like cheeky references to the title in there, or would you like, ooh, it's going to be like a three chapter book, and chapter one is cheap. And then you explain how you're a cheapskate, and then ooh, fast. And you explain how fast you are as a as an as an athlete, as a mm-hmm. runner. And then easy, as in like how desperate you are for a girlfriend. Yeah, that that probably that probably cover it. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, welcome. To this, our 46th episode wow. of the Dungeon Bros Podcast. I'm Connor. And I'm Sam. And we are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. But we do enjoy the dungeons along with the dragons. Yes, we enjoy playing both games, the dungeons and the dragons. Both, uh, both of them, yes. I have not... I have, I have yet to truly encounter a dragon in a dungeon. Mm, uh, as have I. Or... 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 Well, or, or here's, here's a thought. Here's a thought. A dungeon within a dragon like the dragon is so massive that the very innards of the dragon become a dungeon in and of themselves i think that would be cool that would be cool that would be cool jester write that down and she's not even in the she room. is she is she's taking not, a nap she's not even in the room uh but this our 46th episode of the dungeon bros podcast we're talking about ai in D. uh also, also uh how Immediately, even before the announcement of, of some AI ventures, it's already getting pushed back. Yeah. Classic. Classic internet. Uh, we got some Doctor Who commander cards from Magic the Gathering. And got uh, some previews for the Wilds of Eldraine. Yes. Uh, so much anime titty. So much anime titty. I mean, not, not really. Not really anime titty, but anime. It's so much anime. Anime art. Anime art. A little bit of Baldur's Gate. A little bit of D&D Movie 2. Question mark? Question mark. But oh, first, we want to we wanna thank our sponsor, uh, the Costco Hot Dog. Costco Hot Dog. It's cheap. It's long. It fits right in your mouth. Some might say it's fast, cheap, and easy. It is. You also uh, can't buy it without purchasing a 20-ounce beverage along with it. That is true. That is true. You're not able to buy them a la carte. Uh, even Even so. Even with the beverage, probably cheaper than your standard dog. It's still a buck fifty. It's still a buck fifty for a drink and a dog. I don't. They. It's a loss leader for them for sure. Now, is the cost hidden in the sixty dollar a year membership? Sure. I'm gonna choose to ignore that because it's it's quite delicious. I think we need to just eat enough hot dogs in yep. order to offset. You know what? That sixty dollar. You're fucking talking the way I want to hear. You're speaking the words that I want to say. So thank you to Costco and the Costco Hot Dog, uh, sponsor of the Dungeon Bros Podcast. We appreciate you. Uh, Gen Con is this week. <laughs> if you are listening to the podcast, either when we are recording it live on TikTok or when it goes live on Wednesday, August the 2nd, we are probably on our way or already in Indianapolis, Indiana for Gen Con 2023. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've, got, we've got plans to meet up with many other creators. We're going to be playing a lot of Magic going to be maybe playing a little bit of 1 D&D even maybe and some other things maybe some other things there's there's some other things that I don't know if we're allowed to talk about because it's a private event but there's other things as well so that's cool but then also the Gen Con events that we plan to oh do my gosh. oh my gosh so many Lord of the Rings cards will be had and um, some Commander Masters cards yeah. Ooh. from the pre-con decks oh yeah oh yeah I'm very excited it's our second year we're wiser now yes yes last year I would say we um Made a mistake. <laughs> Several, actually. We all the, the all same the, mistake multiple times. <laughs> all of the events we chose to do, ninety percent of the events we chose to do were the seminars, which were like, oh, we're gonna learn a lot. We're gonna learn how yes. to do better content, make better, and all this, become better, you know, homebrewers, uh, yeah. DMs, all that kind of stuff. It was like sitting through college courses. Yeah, the seminars in and of themselves, great. 
Yes. Very well, Lovely. very well put together. Very knowledgeable people. Don't do like eight of them no. <laughs> in the weekend, <laughs> unless that is your jam. If that's your, jam, if you love college and you and you wish you want to relive the glory days, then by all means, do all the seminars. Uh, we're not. No, I I slept through most of my college courses. To be fair. <laughs> I Not didn't. like the intentional, like, I'm going to sleep. It's just like I am so bored and don't mm-hmm. have the ability to move around. Mm-hmm. Dude, I played uh, so much Kingdom Hearts Union Cross on my phone during my accounting class. It's not even funny. Like, I, I'm I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure I, I, I managed to do, like, all of my dailies in that little gotcha game in the accounting course every single time without fail. I also got an A in that class. Hey. So, I mean, it's basic math. <laughs> yeah. Accounting, okay. accounting is nothing if not very basic math. <laughs> still don't want to do just it. Just a lot, just a lot of it. I still don't want to do it. Yeah, I mean, they get paid well. Yeah, I have an, I have a friend who's an accountant. Well, a friend of a friend who's an accountant that we are friendly mm. with one another. He actually invited me to a thing that I didn't end up going to. Was it? It was like they were doing like a backyard barbecue thing. He was, he was doing, he had like, he had like, they were doing like a whole hog. Oh, yeah. I was like, oh wow, damn. I appreciate the invite. No, thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, I'm still playing Final Fantasy 16. Mm-hmm. It still fucking rocks. Uh, environmental storytelling galore. Love the world of Alistheia. If you have not played Final Fantasy 16, it's on the PlayStation 5. Highly, 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 highly recommend. Great fantasy storytelling. Great Final Fantasy storytelling. Uh, some of the side quests are shit. People are giving those side quests a lot more shit than they would would have if this if the if this quality of side quests appeared in your one of your beloved Assassin's Creed games. I would all but guarantee that they would be ranting and raving about how fantastic all the side quests are. Because hmm. the the worst side quests in Final Fantasy 16 are about the same as your average side quest in any other AAA game. That's, that's fair. That's open world and has side quests. But the good ones, oh, oh they're good. And I'm, I'm basically at the end of the game and I'm refusing to do the final mission until I complete all of the side quests. You are milking it for all it's worth. Now, is it frustrating that the game would introduce like four to five side quests and then you do a story you clear them all you do a story mission you get like three four five more side quests and then you would have that pace and then after the second to last mission you get like 12 and then after you complete those 12 there's another at least four that i know of so far after completing those 12 before the fight it's a little bit frustrating Mm -hmm. mildly infuriating possibly but I'm 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 happy to have more time with this game because it is very very good. There you go. It is very good. Uh, you also learned what audiobooks are. No, I knew what audiobooks were. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, a lot of audiobooks that are of quality are, are things that I want to listen to are not available for cheap unless you like to subscribe to something like Audible. But scrolling through, great service. Love to be sponsors. That'd be great. I would they love sponsor it. a lot of people. I know. I, that's that's why I bring it up because it's it's one of those within the realms of possibility. So if we speak it, uh, somebody help us manifest that, please. Manifest. Uh, please. But no, uh, I found the at least uh, the Legend of Dridst. Mm-hmm. Um, the D&D, one of the D&D, very famous D&D books, is available as an audiobook on Spotify for free, read by uh, Russell Johnson. Is it actually free? I, di- I didn't mention this earlier. Is it actually free, or do you just get it for free because you have Spotify Premium? Do you know? I do not know. It did not mention. I just went to the podcasts and shows, and it was available. I can't imagine that it would be like, pre- like, mem- like premium membership gated. Right, because the only the only things I know that are premium membership I get are the unlimited skips and no ads. Yeah, yeah, and you, downloads. Yes, that is true. That is true. Uh, similar similar features available, of course, for my beloved YouTube mm-hmm. premium, where I get YouTube videos without ads, which is yes. by far the best. And I get all of the same Spotify stuff for YouTube Music. It's a good time. Highly recommend either of those services. Yeah. So um, if, uh, if you've never listened, if you've never read any of the uh, any of the D and D books, which I have not, mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. interesting. How do they pronounce his name? Uh, Drids. Is it Drids Durden or Drids Durden or? Uh, it's, it's very pronounced. It's every syllable is pronounced. Drids Durden. Yes. Drids Durden. Oh. God, that's difficult. Fuck you, R.A. And of course, they're using... It's not... So the beginning of the book starts with him before he's born. He's born... What? He's born to uh, a matron of a house using the pain of his birth to power a spell to kill another house. Or to, like, aid her army in killing another house. And so they're going through, like... It's kind of like the the Cimmerillion, where it's like you start the book and it's just a bunch of names. Yeah. 
It's oh like, man, the first two pages of the Silmarillion are just an encyclopedia of uh, of god names, <laughs> <laughs> of really difficult to spell and pronounce god names. God, fucking fantasy writers, man. Fuck it. Why can't why can't they all be like like chill like the Innistrad things like that's Edgar that's Olivia that's fucking that's Tovalar very easy to pronounce things you know there's there's, uh, there's probably there's plenty of there's plenty of complicated there's, gathering names there's L E with an accent E with an umlaut X X U with a fucking at symbol dollar sign star Q. Yeah, that's that's that. that's gonna be my new commander. <laughs> <laughs> okay, love it, love it. We like to go over the upcoming releases every single episode, just so you know what's coming in the world of D and D and Magic: The Gathering. For D and D, we got Bigby presents the Glory of the Giants coming very soon in about two weeks, August fifteenth. On that same day, you're also going to get the Practically Complete Guide to Dragons, found the Fan Delver and Below the Shattered Obelisk, September nineteenth. The only book in the lineup of D and D books coming that have been announced that I'm vaguely interested in. Uh, Planescape, Adventures in the Multiverse, October 16th, and The Book of Many Things on November 14th. All of this, of course, cramming way too much content. Way too much content before the release of 1D&D. Sorry, 5th edition. 5th edition, part 2, The Electric Boogaloo. Yeah, yeah. Match of the Gathering, of course. We've got Commander Masters coming out this weekend. We're going to be playing it on release weekend at... Gen Con, we're going to be getting some of those Commander Precons. Uh, September 1st is pre-release for the Wilds of Eldraine with September 8th launch. We got the Doctor Who Commander decks on October 13th, as well as the Lost Caverns of Ixalan at some point in November of 2023, and a second round of Lord of the Rings also in November, November 3rd, 2023. Can be a little crowded there. Yeah. There's also what the Final Fantasy partnership in 2024 for Universes Beyond, as well as Assassin's Creed. Yeah. Yeah, we're interesting properties. Yeah. Obviously, each of us will be obsessed with one and not the other. <laughs> yeah, well, it's very yeah. They've they've really gone all over the place from Warhammer at the end of last year, which makes sense to me. Two of the biggest like yeah concurrent non competing gaming spaces. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you're going to get Hasbro. Th- obviously, the Transformers thing that makes total sense because sure. Hasbro. D and D that makes total sense because Hasbro. Hasbro. Lord of the Rings, I was surprised by happily. Oh yeah, the big, the greatest fantasy. We're probably going to get Game of Thrones at some point. That'd be interesting. Uh, it it seems like they're reaching more into the video game realm now. It does, at least for this next year. Yeah, which I'm um, not. A, I would love. I would love a Kingdom Hearts universe is beyond. Totally, totally would never happen because Disney. Disney. Yeah, but. I want the Power Rangers one, and it's just like Ooh. every Red Ranger ever. Ooh, yeah. I just want a deck of Red Rangers. Oh my! God. Tommy will be at the helm, of course. Oh my God! Tommy's not a, not a Red Ranger. He's not. He was green and then white. I thought he came back as red. Did he come back as red in like another in like a? Because in Mighty Morphin back in the day, he yeah, was thought, the Green Ranger, which was kind of like the anti-hero Ranger that yeah. was like kind of going against, and then he changed into the White Ranger when, when he fully flip- joined them. On the good I side. I thought he came back as a Red Ranger in the later season. That wouldn't surprise me. There were very few that actually, like, ever, like, came back for multiple teams. But Yeah. And of course, it's been, what, 20 years since I've watched a Power Rangers anything? Gosh. Okay, what were your favorite runs? Obviously, Mighty Morphin. Yeah. One uh, of the goats. Dino. You like Dino? I did not like Dino. I was a big fan of Lightspeed Rescue. Lightspeed Rescue. I think I didn't. I think that was around the time I kind of stopped. Yeah, kind of dropped off. Yeah, it was. It was. There was something about Lightspeed Rescue that like fucking tickled my balls. You know. You know what I'm saying? I don't, and it I just, really don't it, want to know. It tickled them a little bit, and I was interested. Okay. Sure. And then Mighty Morphin. Of course. Well, Mighty Morphin, of course. I mean, that's that's a cl- the, the movie. The movie. Oh yeah. With Ivan Ooze. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, that is a great villain. <laughs> if you have not seen the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers movie, man, that is. <laughs> oh my god. All right. We're what? We're 15 minutes into this podcast. Let's actually fucking talk about some D&D, shall we? We'll hit the meat, and then as usual, we'll wrap up with answering questions of from course. the TikTok. Of course, Hasbro is eyeing AI. For Dungeons and Dragons. Earlier in the week, Hasbro has revealed a new partnership with AI company Explored. X-P-L-O-R-E-D. 
the developers behind the digital plat the digital board game platform Tenburu. Uh, in the press release, Ga- Hasbro's gaming senior vice president Adam Beal said that its partnership with Explored would be would allow the company to quote deliver innovative gameplay to our players and fans, limitless digital expansions to physical games, seamless onboarding, and powerful AI-driven game mechanics, end quote. When asked by GamesRadar and other publications for more information, Beal said AI would be used to generate experiences that could react to player decisions right away and potentially streamline rules to make it easier on newer players. The partnership has also also lets Hasbro study Explored's technology, particularly when it comes to Temburu. Last year, a virtual tabletop solution for D&D was revealed. As of this past May, outlets like Polygon got to play test its pre-alpha version. In said Games Radar interview, Beal danced around the specifics of those AI-driven mechanics, particularly as it relates to the tabletop experiences like D&D. He noted that it uses that its use would quote enrich Hasbro's current games and lead to a wholly new titles being born. But those ambitions may have already hit a snag. Earlier this week, the popular online D&D marketplace, the Dungeon Masters Guild, we don't sell on Dungeon Masters Guild for our homebrew. We do drive through RPG, mm-hmm. but the DMs Guild, it's a great platform. It's basically drive through RPG, but you get access to more D&D stuff that you can include in your homebrew. Great great site, uh, announced that it would restrict the sale of, quote, standalone AI art products, while AI-generated art featured in rulebooks and adventures had to be explicitly tagged as AI. Mm -hmm. And as of July 31st, written content that is, quote, primarily AI-generated wouldn't be allowed on the platform in any capacity. Dungeon Masters Guild, largest third-party digital storefront for Dungeons & Dragons, and at the time of writing of this article... It is not known if its stance will change in response to Hasbro's new relationship with Explored and its eventual plans to incorporate AI into its tabletop titles. Similar, similarly, how much Hasbro is impacted by the Guild's decision isn't presently known. Hasbro's earnings call will, play, will take place on Thursday, October 3rd, or August 3rd, Jesus Christ. So in two days. And on in Thursday. two days. The first day of the annual tabletop convention, GemCon. Presumably, we'll learn more about the company's plans then hmm. they've already discussed previously the their interest in doing ai for D with the ai dungeon master which i think is i th- i think they need to not think in terms of replacing the dungeon master who is arguably the biggest spender in D, yeah. much more than much more than the player i think spinning it as ai dungeon master assistant supplementation supplementary where i i could see a future where a lot of people DM with like laptops sure. open or tablets or whatever. Having the, for example, the D and D Beyond application open, you can go to like your Dungeon Masters tab and you can click activate AI DM assistant, mm-hmm. and it might just be listening to everything that's saying and then popping up suggestions. So it's like, oh, you want to jump over? You want to use your long jump to jump this twenty foot span? Uh, what do I have to do? And then you can look over and the AI might generate a response that you can work with mm-hmm. in text format. Something like that I feel like could be very helpful, but it does seem like Hasbro has indicated in the past that they want to use AI more for uh, replacing the DM and just getting more players because DMing, of course, is one of the biggest barriers to be able to play the game in the first place. Yeah, obviously there are a lot of a lot more people playing than DMing at any given time. It's a one to four to one to seven ratio, oftentimes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, the the fact that there there are people who who love to DM, and I don't think those people could ever be fully replaced, especially by I'm assuming what's going to be. In the realm of the free, uh, the free applications available. Home of the brave. Yes, well. <laughs> yes, because uh, 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 Hasbro and Wizards Coast have talked about making their um, virtual tabletop the yes. free part, and so I assume that this would also be integrated into that as well. Uh, but that being said, yeah, I think I think that the supplementation or that that AI assistant would be a great point, and plenty of people would use that, like. Especially for just like you're saying, long jump rules. Well, okay, so I gotta go look up the long jump rules. But what was what was the meme going around about what speci- like some specific rule like grappling? It was grappling. Grappling. The specific grappling rules and like that kind of stuff, making it easier instead of having to like 
type out and search through a digital book or mm -hmm. pull out a book and search for the page and that kind of stuff. And you can just simply, uh, what are the rules for grappling? Yeah. And then it just populates very quickly. Uh, I could see that as a use case. Another interesting use case, since you bring up the virtual tabletop, um, he talked about new AI-driven game mechanics. Mm -hmm. So I'm imagining what if there is uh, maybe a bonus dungeon or a part of a dungeon uh, in an adventure module. And if you are running it in paper, then it has pre-made dungeons for you. But like the lore of this dungeon is that it's like ever-changing, ever-moving, mm. ever-growing. Ever and if you use the virtual tabletop, there could be like AI-generated dungeon entirely where like... You could be like, oh, I'm on I'm on section one of the dungeon, and mm -hmm. then it AI, the AI generates that section leading to whatever like key points you have to hit, and then you're like, you move on to the next section, generate the next section, and then each section is different, providing maybe a bit more improv for a DM uh, and and more of a unique, uh, driven, different experience for all the players. That's something that could be interesting. D and D the roguelike. D and D the roguelike. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's a roguelike. Everything's a roguelike. Every single thing. But like there are plenty AI obviously is going to be the way of the future. It's we we've 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 moved past the veil. Mm -hmm. It's coming. It's going to happen. It's going to completely it's going to completely change the very foundations of our society in many ways, I think. And obviously they're going to find a way to incorporate AI into everything we know and love in every aspect of our lives. I mean, shoot, Snapchat already has AI. Which, by the way, if you have you tried, have you interacted with your Snapchat no. AI assistant? Man, the answer, the answers and the responses are like they're so funny sometimes. Like you can shame them and they'll be like, "I'm so sorry," but if you shame them for something they think is wrong, they'll be like, "I'm so sorry. Are you sure that's right?" And then we'll try to argue with you. <laughs> it's fucking so like like you put something in like, "What's the color of the sky?" And it's like, "According to my research," and then we'll like be like, "The sky is blue," and then it'll explain why. And it's like, "No, nah, that isn't right. My sky is red right now. I think you're wrong. Don't lie to me." And you'll be like, "I'm sorry that you feel that way. I are you sure that the sky is red? You might be saying and then will like try to explain it's why it so funny help my sky is sepia <laughs> my sky is sepia that would be terrifying that'd be terrifying but ai driven stuff for dungeons and dragons is obviously going to be happening uh i'm sure that even behind the scenes some of that is already happening um ai art and ai writing obviously the the sag aftra strikes that are happening in hollywood right now mm -hmm. uh is really largely related obviously related to pay and compensation and all of that but also related to uh ai replication of like people's voices and likenesses uh ai writing based on source material written mm -hmm. by individuals and all of that kind of stuff um we're, we're, this is going to be something that we'll be grappling with, I feel, for the decades to come. Oh, yeah. I mean, even even a year ago, we, you know, we were first seeing the art the, the art world come mm -hmm. out and, and against AI. Or, and, and it was the prospect of, of uh, what could be. Because even, even a year ago, AI-generated stuff was, like, all abstract mm -hmm. and, like, only vague. Like, you could type into an AI, like, oh, Kermit the Frog on Seinfeld. And you'd be like, if you squint your eyes and you, like, hold your phone away from <laughs> you, you're like, yeah, I can see that. That looks yeah. kind of, that looks vaguely Seinfeldian with with Kermit the Frog there. <laughs> but now you can type uh, Donald Trump being arrested in the streets by New York police officers. And then it looks actually real yeah you can type in one of the most fucked images i've seen recently uh family encases dead grandmother in resin and then it just shows like these people that are hanging out and all smiling and then like a, a grandmother corpse and then clear resin <laughs> It's get off the internet. <laughs> the internet shut down. Pull the plug. <laughs> it's, it's over. Go to go to the fucking Google servers and just hit the off switch. Right. Yeah. As quickly as possible. Um, hopefully, we get some useful tools that are AI driven. I think it's going to be a while before they can properly actually replace, realistically replace a dungeon master for AI. Um, we'll just have to see. And you know, for some people, I, I don't want to be this guy that says it because I feel like people are going to be mad. For some playgroups, it might just be easier and a little bit better if you're running the story yourselves, 
If you don't really have like a pre-written story to go through, you're just experiencing things, you're like a dungeon crawl, you can just tell an AI, make a dungeon, run through the dungeon, you know? I don't think that, I think that it's a hobby that and it's a, that's ubiquitous enough with the fact, like the idea of a dungeon master that, uh, sure, some people will get the use of, oh, I only have my, there's two of us. And we don't really know how, and we don't want to run, so have this thing run for us. There's, but I think the entire uh, the entire like group setting that will be be fought for. Oh yeah, absolutely. For years and years and absolutely. Years. I totally not ever forever. I, I totally see because there's plenty of people that only play D and D for combat. True. Sure. And that's a really easy play. Like as far as if you want to replace the dungeon master with AI, that's probably the easiest route. Because you can just you can have it generate a dungeon, you can have it generate enemy, you can populate it with enemies, and it can run the combats for you. And I think that's probably going to be the first step. How long? I mean, my brain says my my logic brain says, well, I mean, that's probably a couple years away. But then I think about it a little bit more, and I'm like, that could be like this year with how fast AI is evolving and growing and getting better. Yeah, <laughs> which is a little bit ridiculous. But I digress. Moving on. Moving on. We've seen some Magic Gathering promos for the Doctor Who Commander set, specifically Commander Dex. Are they? Are they did they it's expand only, it to a set now? I'm pretty sure it's only Dex. like a mini set. It is just set. It, as far as I'm, as far as I've been, as far as I am aware, it is just the Dex. I feel like I've seen booster packs for it though. That's interesting. And, oh, collector. I think it's collector boosters and the Dex. Okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, there was a preview panel at MagicCon Barcelona over the last weekend. During the panel, they dove deep oh, 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 into the upcoming collaboration with the iconic television franchise, Doctor Who. Mm-hmm. Some notable cards below. There's been there's several plane chase cards. Yeah, which absolutely makes sense for this deck. For these for this oh yeah style of of deck. I mean, it's basically tiny multiversal jumping around hopping around yep. having a good old time uh bad wolf bay is one of the first ones here on earth uh quite a few sagas as well and the sagas i will point out a lot of them have more than three chapters associated with them yeah uh much how the long list of the ends and the lord of the Rings set was the long the most chapters on any um saga we're seeing a ton of six five chapter sagas here that just trigger the same thing over and over again which is totally cool interesting some interesting tokens <laughs> um the cyberman you can cover a face down creature that has become a cyberman with this reminder card it's a 2-2 cyberman artifact creature so the um oh gosh oh gosh why am i blanking it's basically a reskin of the um uh manifesting manifesting cl- oh n- where you can play a card face down and then until you flip it it's just a 2-2 creature morphing morphing that's the one morphing yeah uh we also get some other mechanics like the doctor's companion which comes on certain human creatures which says uh you can have two commanders as long as one is this and the other one is a doctor um which totally makes sense so like rose tyler very uh very prominent uh character from the new newer half of the series um is one of those so you can have her and one of the doctors as a companion, as companion commanders, which is That's, pretty cool. They, I was saying this earlier today when we were hanging out, um, the partner mechanic needs to be utilized so much more. The mm. partner with mechanic, and this is this is effectively a variation of the partner with mechanic. Yeah. Where two specific creatures can be partnered together, that totally needs to be a thing. There is no reason that in the Crimson Vow set, Edgar Charmed Groom and Olivia the Crimson Bride couldn't have just been partner with Olivia Olivia Crimson Bride and Edgar the Charm Groom, respectively. Same with Legolas Counter of Kills and Gimli Counter of Kills in the Lord of the Rings set. Merry and Pippin, Sam, uh, there the was Commander. Sam and Frodo, obviously. Sam and Frodo are, but they're just partners. True. They're not even partner with. Uh, no, they're partner with. Are they partner with? They're partner with. But they're like the only two cards, and yeah, they're the, the commanders yeah. for one of the commander decks. Yep. The partner with mechanic, they should just be throwing on shit, because I think that's just... A, thematically cool. Uh, not really anybody is playing two-headed giant with most sets, so it's not really going to affect in that way very much. Mm-hmm. And even if it did, who cares? Yeah. It's fine. <laughs> it's totally fine. Um, you pointed this out, and it really it it drew my attention the most. River Song. Uh, legendary creature, human time lord rogue for one blue-red. It's 2-2. Two, two. 
Uh, meet in reverse. You draw cards from the bottom of your library rather than the top. And spoilers, whenever opponent scry... That's the name of the ability. Yes. It's spoilers. This is one of her catchphrases yes. in the series. Whenever an opponent scries, surveils, or searches their library, you put a plus one, plus one counter on River Song. Then River Song deals damage to that player equal to its power. That seems like a really fun build around mechanic. Oh, yeah. Personally. Because scrying is just an action that occurs on so many cards throughout Mall of Magic. And there's a lot of cards that let you place cards randomly or ordered however you want on the bottom of your library. Yeah. So effectively, like, reverse scrying. <laughs> yeah, or just take them out of the graveyard and put them on the bottom of your deck. Exactly, exactly. And then you theoretically could draw them back pretty quickly. An interesting mechanic that we haven't really seen before. What do you got pulled up? Um... It was. It is Missy. She's a legendary Time Lord Rogue, three in Grixis. That's blue, black, red. Uh, whenever another non-added effect creature dies, return to the battlefield under control, face down and tapped. It's a two-two Cyberman artifact creature. So that's where the Cybermen come in. At the beginning of your end step, each opponent faces a villainous choice, um, which I think this villainous choice sounds like a mechanic. That it's, I've not heard of. It seems similar from what reminder text I've been seeing on cards. It seems similar to voting mechanics. The Council's Dilemma. That kind of stuff. Each artifact creature you control deals one damage to that opponent. Or you draw a card and chaos ensues. Chaos ensue being a plane scape or a plane chase mechanic. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that seems really big in this deck is the time counters on things. Mm. Um, so when you suspend a card, for example, you pay the suspend cost instead of its casting cost, and you exile it with so many time counters, um, indicated by the card, and then at the beginning of upkeep, you remove a time counter, and when you remove the last one, you may cast it for free. Um, and there are a lot of cards that say... Uh, time travel. Time travel, which will allow you to remove, add or remove time counters. So delaying other people casting and casting your things quicker for cheaper. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I feel like I've seen cards that are like adding time counters to like creatures and permanents and stuff that want counters or want time count or like it does something. There's some other thing going on there. Yeah. But of course, as we get closer and closer to that October release date, uh, that is, again, October 13th. 13th, three days before my birthday. Happy birthday uh, it, not to you in, from Doctor from Who. From Doctor Who, which is also um, on my actual birthday. It's the Planescape Adventures in the Multiverse. Ooh, that'll be fun. Um, but yeah, so we'll uh, get to see more and more as those get announced. Yes. Uh, I do want to finally point out the Doctors. Yes. They showed the 4th, the 10th, and the 13th. Uh, the... The special frames for them, I think, are awesome. Mm -hmm. Oh, they're super cool. They're very unique. Uh, they're tardisy. And collector boosters for this set, they're serialized versions of the Doctors. Uh, for example, the fourth Doctor has 504 for the serialized version. The tenth Doctor, 510. The thirteenth, 513. Uh, serialized cards, I think, are a net positive for the Magic the Gathering economy mm. uh chase cards that can be really valuable that are limited but they're also just cards that anybody can get so it's not like limited in a way that not everybody could play with the card yeah i i will say that is one of the um nice things that they have done is never make anything so unique that it's like oh it's not they're not blue eyes white dragons from the Yu-Gi-Oh anime yeah there aren't just four of them in existence yeah. there's four of these ones that have numbers on them but then there's you know 10,000 mm -hmm. the other ones. Now, I will, I before before anyone says in the comments, not that anyone comments on this, but before anyone says in the comments, yes, there are, like, the Wizards of the Coast office exclusives that they give out to, like, employees or people and shit that are unique, mm -hmm. that they don't release in booster packs, and they include mechanics and stuff that are way too powerful for regular gameplay. Yeah. <laughs> As just kind of, like, a cool thing. That's not really the same thing that we're talking about at all. But... Doctor Who, this is gonna be more your jam. I'm gonna there's, jam jam on it. There's also some there's also like some weird, like vaguely anime art style. The alt art style. Alt arts for these, which, you know. Whatever. Um October thirteenth, if you like plane chase. Ooh, oh, one more. One more thing I wanna bring up. The foretold soldier. Mm. It's weird. Four mana six six. Two green green for a six six alien zombie soldier. Must be blocked. Can't be blocked by more than one creature. Whenever it deals damage, exile it face down, and it becomes foretold. You can foretell it for one and a green. Weird. Weird. I don't know how I feel. It's 
wasn't there oh no it's not the right colors but the 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 D D movie secret lair oh yeah was the one that wanted you to foretell Edgar. stuff but or yeah not the not the right colors no that, that he was yeah he was red blue yeah oh well some weird mechanics going on in this set not really my jam but i'm sure you'll jam oh also the one one human tokens that make doctor spells cost one less to cast um, yeah. i don't know what generates that but we'll find out that'll be that'll be really interesting uh moving on we got some we got a couple things just to you were mentioning uh, uh uh some anime art yes which i think is a nice segue it is. Uh, for The Wilds of Eldraine is coming out in September. They showed off some reprints that are going to have special anime art style treatments for Magic the Gathering cards. Uh, you may not like the anime art styles, but you might like the cards that are being reprinted. Yes. <laughs> With a whole bunch of very adorable anime ducks on a large pile of eggs, you have Doubling Season. It's a Hydra Goose. It is... Oh, it's a hydra! Oh, it's a hydra goose! I didn't even realize that. I thought it was just a bunch of ducks. <laughs> it's a hydra goose. That's even that's ridiculous. Um, that's that out of context. That doesn't make a lick of sense. No. Uh, but doubling season, greater oromancy, smothering tithe, which is the most anime of all the anime arts. It is very in, anime that they've shown so far. The smothering tithe, aggravated assault, which looks awesome. Necropotence looks awesome, and ristic study. Yeah, all of these cards are those that people have been begging for reprints since they've been printed the first time, and, and since they've been some of them reprinted again. Um, they all, all of these are staples in pretty much every format that they're legal. Yeah, very very high value reprints. If you don't like the anime art style, sorry, <laughs> but these will inevitably drive down the prices of these cards, which is the main reason. Uh, we want to bring it up. Uh, we do want to shout out. I want to shout out some of the artists. There's six borderless anime art cards. Uh, Doubling season. The art is by Kemon Michi. Oh my gosh, I should not have <laughs> agreed to do this. Uh, Greater Oromancy by Mai Okuma. Smothering Tithe by Daisuke Tasuma. Ristic Study by Fuzikoko. I think. Necropotence by Kuragure and Aggravated Assault by Zazero. I don't know what some of these names mean, but those are the artists. I don't know who they are. They're Japanese artists doing anime art, so you know, there's that. Anyway, Wilds of the Drain, we're excited. Preview season will kick off uh, kick off on August fifteenth, and pre release again will occur on September first through September seventh, with full launch on September eighth. Uh oh, a little bit, a little bit of a bonus here. The new set will come with a bonus sheet of magic cards with the theme Enchanting Tales that are reprinting a lot of these cards. There are 63 Enchanting Tale cards to collect. 20 of them come with the borderless booster fund treatments featuring anime style artwork from Japanese artists. Should have probably led with that. 63 reprints of notable things. We know what six of them are, and there are six of the 20 that are going to have anime art, and they're very good. Yeah, super cool. They're very good cards. Uh, next... Dungeons and Dragons 2 movie. Electric Boogaloo. Could be made. You've made that joke several times. It's the only joke. You have to make the joke every time. Do you? Yes. I don't think you do. It's a running gag. You could You could do two dragons, two dungeons, two dragons. Oh, that's a good one. Like, too fast, too furious? Yes, yes. Or or um, Spider-Man Tokyo Drift mm. for the third, of course. Uh, Spider-Man being... Dungeons and Dragons doesn't have a third, so I had to go with something that had yes. a third, which was Spider-Man in this case. Dungeons and Dragons Homecoming. <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons Homecoming. It could be made. A lot of we ourselves included. A lot of people were very concerned that there wasn't going to be a sequel to the Dungeons and Dragons movie. We thought it was a very good movie. I enjoyed myself. It was a great time. Uh, seemed to somewhat fail in the box office as it did not really make a ton of profit. It it cleared. It was in the black. It made profit, but not a lot. A lot of people just kind of wrote off that there would not be a sequel because of the success, but. As Paramount CEO Brian Robbins says, nothing is a foregone conclusion. In a recent interview, he revealed that as a label, Paramount needs to find a way to make the creation of the next Dungeons & Dragons movie cost less. This would suggest that Paramount is satisfied with its production so far. Therefore, the authorities would like to make another one, but for less money. Uh, there is no denying that the smaller than expected profits from the movie may have resulted from the unfortunate release date timings, among other things, being forced to compete with something as 
box office dominating as the Super Mario Brothers movie. Could have could have been uh, a little bit of a challenging release time. Yeah, for the Dungeons and Dragons movie. Also, high profile marketing campaign was also not carried out, which may have prevented Honor Among Thieves from being seen by potential viewers who were previously unfamiliar with said film. It was also it was also made during COVID times, which probably made the cost quite a bit more. But um, I've been saying for a lot of entertainment media, they they need to find a way not to make it bigger and grander and more verbose, make video games longer, hmm. increase production value. Like, no, I'm as much as I love Final Fantasy 16. I would be fine if it had ended by now. Yeah. And just it was good quality. And it, co- and it would cost less to make, which means they make more profit. You know, um, a game like Grand Theft Auto V, a game like Red Dead Redemption, probably costs like five hundred million dollars to make. Mm-hmm. But because they're massive, they can make that money back. We can't keep ballooning the cost of great things. And I think I think CEO of Paramount, Brian Robbins, has the right idea of trying to reduce cost on some of these entertainment properties. Yeah, I know for at least myself when it comes to, like you're saying, video games, where it's like, let's make them bigger and bigger. No, I have already enough to play. Let me... Are give you me too shorter. much? Yeah. I'm, that's why I've been enjoying some like indie games recently. It's like, oh, I'm going to spend eight hours on this. Maybe 15 if I want to like platinum it or something. I would much rather a 15 to 20 hour tight, riveting, amazing experience mm-hmm. than a 60-hour open world with a million side quests that kind of suck. Oh, yeah. And this is coming from someone who loves the epic 100-hour Persona 5 Royal. JRPG. Turn-based. The production value is through the roof because the gameplay is turn-based. Yeah. That being said, hope we see a D&D sequel. Yeah. That'd be awesome. I'd be down for it. As long as it, you know, as long as the uh, the quality doesn't suffer. Yeah. Part of that, I think they might benefit from a little bit less CGI. Mm-hmm. But it might be cheaper to do CGI now because I'm sure there's AI tools that are going to help production houses make things quicker, make things easier. I'm totally, I'm totally fine with AI in certain respect. Not to bring it back to a couple stories. Yeah. But in the production of a movie or a game, it's like, I don't want... I don't want to have an artist spending fucking 20 hours making a texture mm-hmm. for like a rock wall. Yeah. I'd rather an AI make that and then have my artists like designing buildings and design like stuff that actually matters a bit more and then let AI deal with textures and distant forests and like mo- like massive groups of people that are being CGI generated and that kind of stuff. Um also, not to bring it back to the best fantasy property in the world, The Lord of the Rings. Those films, they developed technology to create massive hordes of CGI characters, but those also still had to be made and programmed and mm-hmm. written and, and made by people. Yeah. And I feel like you could offload all of that to AI. And I think that would be fine. I think the... Uh, the as long as the source, of course. Sure. What is being generated from. I think the D&D movie also has, a, like, has room to breathe with that because... We saw that they did some, you know, a lot of scenes that were just the four characters doing D and D character stuff that we all that we as D and D players know and love, and then they did have some really big things like obviously the entire chase thing with uh, Thumberchud. Oh yeah, and, that was cool. I always forget about Thumberchud. Oh yeah, the fat <laughs> red dragon. That's awesome. But then also like the uh, the whole end uh, um, labyrinth thing where they mm-hmm. incorporated like fifteen different. Uh, you know, character fifteen different classic monsters. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, that the labyrinth is fun. Uh, the fight against that last red wizard mm-hmm. was awesome. Oh, that was super cool. I like I like how they they thwarted her and how they like pull they pulled one over on her too. Like it was good stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff. Last bit of a uh, last bit of, th- of of news for the day. We got some last minute info on Baldur's Gate three. Baldur's Gate three has been in alpha, beta, pre release. We talked about how you can fuck the the druid uh, while it's a bear. Weird. Whatever. Uh, it's releasing on October third, the day after this podcast goes live. Uh, there's a breakdown of what specific time of day you'll be able to play it uh, in America. If you're on the West Coast, it's eight a.m. If you're on the East Coast, it's eleven a.m. Time zones in between. Do the math. Uh, if you don't live in the United States, 
You can do the math from that. Uh, <laughs> there is... Uh, that is just for the PC version. There is going to be a PlayStation 5 version of Baldur's Gate 3, which will launch roughly a month later on September 6th. However, if you pick, if you purchase the digital-only Deluxe Edition or the Collector's Edition, you'll get 72-hour early access on September 3rd. The Deluxe Edition costs $80 and includes other goodies, uh, including some digital stuff for the game uh they have talked about a release on xbox series x and s but uh the developer larian has not said uh it will like is said it will likely not be out until 2024 i think it's interesting that they're not able to get ports working on certain SKUs. i assume it's because the xbox series s is like the little brother the less powerful mm-hmm. one so games are kind of being that are multi-platform are kind of being held back by that much like how games were being held back by the playstation 4 and the xbox one before they yeah. fully transition to the next generation. Uh, Baldur's Gate 3 file size is 122 gigs. It's massive and will not have a preloading option. So starting at the designated release time for your time zone is when you'll be able to begin downloading and installing the game, which I think is a little ridiculous. That, that sucks. That really sucks. That, that just means you're not going to play it for three days because the t- t- servers are going to be crapped out oh my gosh so bad it, it's it's unfortunate it there's so many games where if you buy it digitally you can download it you can get it installed if you launch it early it just says you gotta wait till this time yep i, f- I feel like that's standard practice it, it's becoming standard uh, it's kind of surprising that a game of this size isn't going to have that option available to you and then lastly early access saves it's been an early access for nearly three years and unfortunately uh, the developer larian has confirmed that early access will saves will not be compatible with the final version on top of that the studio has actually recommended players make sure to delete any early access save datas before launching the final game in order to avoid any conflicts they do spin this of course saying that they feel the changes to the final version are substantial enough the players are just better off starting fresh rather than trying to move over a previous save, which kind of sucks. But at the same time, that's what you get for devoting three years to a game that's in early access. Mm-hmm. That's just me. I've also you know, talked to some people who have who have started the early access and they're like, yeah, I put a couple hours into it, but I didn't. But once I, you know, heard that because that's been that's been a rumor for a while. It's like, uh, I didn't want to put any more effort in since it was yeah. going to get all wiped away. Yeah, I mean, I, that's kind of the game you play. <laughs> no pun intended. Well, we're doing a comedy special, pun intended. Are we? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I Intend think... your puns, God damn it. Yeah, that is true. That is true. Um, it is kind of what you get. It, it, it's what you should expect when you're playing games like this. It's not... Which I think early access and demos are two very different things. Yeah. Early access and beta tests, like, I don't, in my mind, I don't have the expectation that that data, save data is going to move over. If I'm playing a demo for a game, particularly if it's in, like, the week or two leading into a game's release, like, Mm -hmm. for example, Final Fantasy XVI had a demo that was basically just the tutorial stage of the game. Yeah. Which, when playing through it, I was like, wow. This is a lot of the game. This is shot. Wow. They're showing so much in the grand scheme of the game. Very little, (laughs) very, very little. But they let you carry over the progress you've made in the demo to the main game. So you don't have to replay that section and you just start from where you left off in the demo, which is right before the first time skip of the game. I think that's the way to go. Personally, Mm -hmm. games need to have demos more often in my mind, particularly now that games are getting more expensive. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Mm-hmm. Do you have anything else you want to say about the Baldur's Gate 3? I'm waffling back and forth on whether or not I'll actually play it. Probably won't. I Pro- probably won't. I've, you know, it feels like I, I should at least put something into it because it's in our uh, niche. It is It is in the niche. If there's a demo, I might check it out. <laughs> I don't think I, if, if I'm not going to be buying a $70 game that I'm not confident that I'm going to play. At this point in my life, that's fair. That's right. If we'll I had uh, more disposable income, I'd hop in. I'd give it a try. We'll let our friend Darren play it and then give us a review. I'm not entirely. I'm, I don't entirely trust his video game opinions. If I'm being completely honest with you, he has fine video game opinions. He has fine video game opinions. He has the same opinions as as, as you know. He has the same quality of opinions as most people do. I think. Yeah, which is shit. <laughs> but 
He just doesn't have a platform to talk about them. That is true. That is true. We will end this episode of the podcast as we end every episode of every podcast with questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and or ideas from the TikTok live chat. While Sam is looking through that, I'm going to go through a little bit of a spiel. You can get this podcast every other Wednesday when it goes live on YouTube. You can also get it on Spotify. You can get it on YouTube Music now. You can get it on Apple, Google Podcasts, Microwave Ovens, uh, New Age Refrigerators, AI Driven, AI Driven toasters and the like um you can subscribe to us on youtube we want to make youtube videos we keep saying that we do we keep saying that all right my computer's dead because of a thunderstorm the power surge killed it so that's one obstacle to overcome of course most of you follow us on tiktok where we have nearly forty thousand followers Ooh. we do weekly live streams on monday monday night magic playing magic the gathering 9 p.m hanging Eastern out time. chatting it's always a good time uh again we're going to gen con we mentioned it at the top of the show we're going to be at gen con come say hi and samuel the tiktok live what do they got in the chat for us camouflage says hello Oh, yes, of course, Camouflage. We know them. Um, Roman says, D&D is a great way to spend time with family and friends. Absolutely correct. Absolutely. I uh, really saw a rise during the pandemic when people oh, were yeah. like, we can do this on the computer. We can do it virtually. There's virtual tabletops and Discord and D&D Beyond. It was awesome. Uh, the King of Calamity, when we're talking about AI, says, I like using AI for NPC creations. That is true. Uh, using a lot of those, like, chat GPT I've, I've messed around a little bit with that in creating NPCs, and it can be very useful. I don't know if I would use it. Uh, if I were doing a full homebrew campaign again, which is a lot of work, so I don't know if I would, uh, I would probably consider it just to fill in some interesting characters, but, you know, <laughs> something to play around with. All righty, let's see. Sarah asks, do you guys stream your D&D games? We do not. Nope. We've talked about doing it in the past. Unfortunately, that's big time commitment. That is a big time commitment. That is a scheduling commitment that, while we might be able to commit to, would we be able to convince three to five other people to do that consistently? I don't know. I don't know. It would be, it would be nice. I do want to learn um, more virtual tabletop stuff. I mentioned this last week. Uh, last episode, sorry, not last week, two weeks ago on the last episode of the podcast, uh, Dungeon Alchemist on Steam, yeah. uh, which like generates 3D digital maps for you. They also, you can incorporate um, your, your, oh my God, Hero Forge miniatures. You can create, you can pull in the digital 3D model assets and pull them into uh, the virtual world they have. And apparently you can pair it with like Roll20 and stuff. Hmm. Apparently. Wasn't there like something with Roll Twenty about people not liking it because something drama, something something canceled, something? I don't remember. But it, they 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 can connect to a couple of virtual tabletops where you can import these three D maps. Three D maps being the thing that makes me more interested in virtual D and D. Uh, and I do have some college friends and stuff that live all about that seem like they they mentioned before that they're interested in virtual D and D. So that would be totally fun, but. Jesse Allen says, so I was, I'm thinking, I was thinking of a campaign I run, want, want to run in person, but I don't know how to get players, uh, 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 in, in, indoctrinate your friends, indoctrinate your friends. Also, uh, just telling your group of friends that you want to play D and D and you want to be a dungeon master. The ones that are like kind of interested in D and D it's like, Oh cool. I don't have to think very hard about doing it. I can just be a player. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's how I got several of my players. I was yeah. like, Hey, I want to run a D and D game. It's like, you're running sweet. <laughs> And, you know, there's a lot of people out there who, you know, even with D&D's massive surge in the past couple of years, plus its, its linear growth over the past three decades, um, like more than that, five decades, um, just don't know or haven't thought about it before. Yeah. And we'll just be like, oh, yeah, I could do that. And then as Connor was mentioning, uh, you could, yeah, you'd hit up people online. Hit up your friends Ooh, yeah. from college or, or from high school or whatever, who it's like, hey, you know, you live in California now. What's wrong with you? Also, mm -hmm. you want to jump on Discord once a week? I, I f somewhat regularly get texts. Uh, messages on TikTok and such from one of my one of my best friends from college's wife. Uh, because she really wants to play D and D like really badly, <laughs> like really, really badly. She's like, you need to DM for us. I'm like, we'll see about that. <laughs> we'll see about that. 
All right. First, I need a functioning desktop computer again. <laughs> Grump says, hey, guys, I'm new DMing, and I'm worried my campaign isn't going to isn't going to plan isn't going to plan no punctuation here Sorry. okay hey i'm gonna start over. hey guys <laughs> i'm a new dm and i'm worried my campaign isn't going to plan it is homebrew and everyone is having a good time but not going through the story grump that's perfectly all right yeah so there is i, I feel this is you've, you've stumbled upon one of the classic blunders oh yes land war in asia during the winter no um one only only slightly less well known <laughs> It's you don't go in on a Sicilian when death is on the line. Only slightly <laughs> less well known. known. Uh, <laughs> Princess Bride, great movie. Oh, God, um, such a good movie. But uh, only, sl- <laughs> but yes. As much as you want to have a plan and you want to tell this story, you, you you're not you're not writing a book here. You you've got this group of other people who all have their thoughts and input to it as well. Mm-hmm. And so you need to shepherd them. Yes. And and if you, if you you can always hit these big story beats. I feel mm-hmm. like, you know, your 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 big bo- bad boss guy is going to do these things. You can hit yeah. those, but yeah, necessarily like having them step 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 through every dungeon, or make sure they talk to this person, this person, this person, so they find out a weird mystery in this town. It's very hard to force those interactions to happen naturally. The best thing that I have come up with that, uh, for the example of the mysteries mm-hmm. in a town, say there's a couple pieces of information. I would I would not make it more than two or three. Mm-hmm. Too many pieces of information, they're never going to find it. Um, if you really if you really need them to find it, they don't need to roll for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you shouldn't care what NPC has what information. The first one that they find and talk to should have the first piece of information. The second one that they find and talk to should have the second piece of information, and so on and so forth. Um, gating certain things behind roles is also a, a classic blunder, as we've mentioned. Um, and then, if you want them to encounter the spooky house in the swamp, but they really want to go to the plains, maybe there's just a spooky house on the plains. Yeah, it doesn't or, have to be in the swamp. Or maybe they go to the plains. They complete the plains thing. They move on. You go to the next town. Hey, guess what? There's another swamp there. Yeah. Or maybe you know if whether if you if you did a lot of foreshadowing on this swamp beforehand. Yeah, maybe you just take whatever section you want and put it over here. Yeah. You take you take this town and you push it somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, that's a spongebob reference we're getting all the references in here um but yes so as much as as much you know as much as you want your uh your your game your your story to go as planned it's really hard to you know linearly plot that when you're not writing a book that's true that's true roles and players are always going to mess things up Hell as, yeah. as they should and that's the fun of D&D indeed Indeed. Ow. And D&D, before you, but while, while you read the next question, I just want to point out, we use these, like, sports water bottles to drink water from. Yeah. These are the worst vessels for liquid to be consuming for an audio-based production. <laughs> really the ones that, pfft, ooh, ooh, the, every time you fucking drink, it needs to fucking... Let air back in. The ASMR is ridiculous. I, I try to do it so quietly, and I put the bottle under the table every time to let air back in, because it's always fucking loud. <laughs> so if you've been hearing that, it's when we've been drinking water. Will we remember this for the next time? Probably not. These are convenient to drink out. They are, and I keep losing water bottles. Um, the buzz That was just for you guys. The buzzsaw. The buzz, buzzsaw's ready. Asks, what do you think of Glory of Giants? Uh, pff, not really worthwhile in my mind. Yeah, we talked about this more in our last podcast, episode forty-five. Yeah. Um. So go check that one out. But briefly, it's not. It's it's got a uh, it's got a bestiary, and that's probably all you're ever going to use. There's some interesting giant lore and character options. Why this stuff can't be just included in? 
they really need to get into the realm of something like Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft, mm-hmm. where it's there's this great campaign setting. You've got things like the hex blood. You've got like some vampirism. You've got these character options in a setting where those options make sense. Make a setting. Make a campaign. Make something that incorporates giants, and then include all of the cool giant lore and character options and bestiary in that setting or campaign. That is where these kinds of products should be. The Fizzband's Treasury of Dragons, I believe the first episode of the Dungeon Bros podcast. Yeah. R- really cool. Dragons, I think, are a bit of an exception because Dungeons and Dragons yeah. is a bit of an exception. But that style of book, they've done a couple times. They need to just be in the campaign setting that they're clearly meant for. The Fizzband's Treasury of Dragons was clearly meant for Dragonlance. Yeah. They should have just kind of put them together and made a super book. Mm-hmm. People would buy it. The product would be better. The Glory of the Giants, the content I'm sure is going to be perfectly fine, pretty good. For the price, it needs to come with something that warrants the creation of that information. You know? What was that face for? Um I'm I'm trying to decipher this question. Ah yes, the classic the classic internet based text question hieroglyphs that well, need to be deciphered for content. Midwest Booch. Oh. As I said, are you taking questions? And uh, then they, they asked, have either of you really been far, even as decided to use even go want to do look more like? Is this what a brain aneurysm feels like? Uh, I don't know. Is, my, is the left side of my face like drooping? No. Okay, good. I feel I I couldn't tell if you just were if that was just poorly written or if I was like having a stroke. Midwest Booch, if, Booch, if you are still in, um, I'm sorry we don't understand your question. But if you retype it, I'll try I'm, again. I'm not. I'm not sorry. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> trying to be polite. Ah, fuck the politeness. Be true to ourselves, or at least me. Be true to me. Write write pithier and questions. <laughs> be pithy. Be succinct. Jay Pessel asks, this is a mechanical question, damage before or after adding, or do you have the damage before or after adding? So half, it, half. So five plus three become, is it, is, so is it five plus three becomes eight halved to four, or do you have five rounded down plus three rounded down equals two plus one equals three? When you're having damage because of resistances, it's all encompassing. So if something does 2d8 plus 4 fire damage and it's attacking something that's resistant to fire, you do 2d8 plus 4, then you half it. Uh, The exception to that rule are certain things that go in the reverse of doubling. Uh, Critical hits, it's usually doubling the dice, and then you add the modifier to it, generally speaking. There are, of course, exceptions to all of these. But as long as you're being consistent, that's what matters. Yes, much like Magic the Gathering. The exception supersedes the rule. Ooh, uh, sorry. Reading through some comments here. How dare you? How dare you? Reading? Hmm. I didn't know you know how to read. Hmm. You know that line was improvised in uh, the Chamber of Secrets? When uh, Harry and... When Harry and Ron are... uh, Polyjuiced into Crab and Goyle. Oh, with that. And then, and then, uh, and then Harry is wearing glasses as Goyle. Oh, yeah. I think. And he's like, "Why are you wearing glasses?" I was uh, um, uh, reading. And then, uh, then Mouthful. Tom felt Tom Felton forgot his lines as Draco, <laughs> and he's like, "Reading." Yeah. I didn't know you knew how to read. And then made a face and just walked away. And they were like, "Well, that's, <laughs> that's funny. That's Let's keep you. that." <laughs> And one under says homebrewing or full, filling a or fooling a campaign. And what are your thoughts on a tiefling barbarian? Homebrew or I'm assuming we're T- asking tiefling barbarian. Cool. Pre-written versus homebrew. Is uh, what so I that's assume. what we're going. Yes, that's what I'm assuming as well. Doing a full homebrew campaign requires a lot of work. If you have an idea and you're excited about that idea and you're passionate about that idea and you want to see that idea to completion. Hey, hey you. Um, then by all means, do that. I find I have found in my DMing, my longest campaign that I ran was completely homebrew. 
It was a lot of fun. A lot of fun stories. A lot of fun characters. Uh, I was able to do whatever I wanted, whatever mm-hmm. ideas I came up with, and that is nice. That being said, it is so much easier to have a pre-written thing and just add shit to it. Mm-hmm. Change things, add to it, put a new enemy in, add a whole other chapter, add a different dungeon, add whatever you want. I think that's a much better way to start out because it can be very daunting doing an entire homebrew thing. You could also, uh, for example, the Lost Minds of Fandelver are is now free. The the, the yeah uh, intro, the old intro uh, campaign is a free on D and D Beyond, and you could do. There's the podcast uh, Adventure Zone, and they ran through that, and then hard chop weird shit, mm-hmm. and just started doing their own thing. Uh, so it's like, yeah, they go through the first couple of chapters and, you know, if you've read, if you've ever read it it's before, it's like, okay, you're doing the caravan, you come across this weird thing, you go into this town, you task around, then you go into the caves and then they're like, all right, now you're in space. Sure. Why not? Yeah, exactly. I, I'm a big fan of the Call of the Netherdeep pre-written thing for, uh, with, made in partnership with Critical Role. There is a lot of options in a book like that where you, you go to a city that's massive and you can just you can just fuck off with the main story for a while and do whatever mm-hmm. you want. You can add new interactions with villains, you can create temporary villains that are only for specific locations. There's a lot of fun that you can do. Um, that being said, there are few things as wonderful in this world as running a D&D campaign of a world that you've created with characters you've created, with villains you've created, and your players are eating that shit up. Mm-hmm. There's something real nice about that. Oh, yeah. It's also very easy to fall into tropes. <laughs> it is. It is. It is. There were, on more than one occasion, we would be doing something, and then one of my players would be like, ah, oh, Lord of the Rings, huh? <laughs> I was like, yep. There was one, there was one, of, one of my favorite sections of the homebrew campaign that I ran was, like ballroom espionage like you've got to distract these people so that these people can go up so that this part of the party can go upstairs and like sneak into an office and find shit and I based a small little number lock puzzle uh, if you've seen the second National Treasure movie, The Book of Secrets, <laughs> when they are in the White House, in the Oval Office, and it's like the drawers that pull out, and then all of them are set to different lengths of being pulled out, and then a certain combination of them it clicks and unlocks. Yeah. And it was, it was really cool to, like, you open the drawer, it goes click, 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 and then the, here's what's the contents of the drawer. And then I was doing the click, 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 and they're like, why are you clicking? Like, they're like, we close it, we open it, and you hear click, 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 click. It's like, that's weird. And then they were like, what, what is going on? And then it took about maybe three minutes for one of them to be like, wait a minute. <laughs> I look on the underside where the, where the rails of the thing are. I'm like, okay, you notice there's numbers at certain intervals throughout the thing. And they're like, this is National Treasure, isn't it? And he was like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> shut up. Yes, it is. It's cool, though. Yeah. And they enjoyed it very much. And then they looked through the office and they found references to numbers and they were able to put things together and click, click, click. And then there was like a little puzzle box in the desk and it opened up and they got the little journal they needed. It's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Highly recommend looking for inspiration from properties you enjoy. <laughs> that was a bit of a tangent, but. Well, this last, the last comment for the evening uh, comes from B. Front, Franz. B. Franz. Uh, Franz. Thumbs up. That's that's their, in their name. Oh, is B France thumbs up? Sure. Uh, and asks when will they play MTG? Well, B France, <laughs> you made the last question a promotion for our Monday Night Magic live stream, and a great way to roll into our sign up. Yes, yeah, so we play Magic every Monday night right here on TikTok. Yes, nine o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Or daylight time, depending on the time of year. Are they getting... Wait, they're getting rid of daylight time, aren't they? Pretty sure, yeah. Is it... Is, well, did we already have the last one? Or is the next one the last I one? I think the next one is last one. We'll have Fuck. to look it up. Fuck. <laughs> I'm so done with the time change. <laughs> I'm so done. Regardless, Eastern time. 9 p.m. every single Monday. We usually go live like five to ten minutes early and just kind of vamp for a little bit while we just shuffle our decks basically uh we play two player commander historic brawl rules but without the horse historic brawl deck building ban list so we have like soul they're just our regular commander decks but we play two two player we don't track commander damage it's a whole thing uh highly recommend it 
we would love to give you a top-down view. As some of you might notice in this live, we have a camera up here uh, because we want to do a top-down thing. But TikTok Live Studio, which is required to do it on TikTok, uh, fucking sucks, requires too much uh, resources from my computer, and uh, our views like top out at eight. Yeah. As opposed to the normal rate of like 50 to 100. So check out our YouTube and subscribe because we might be doing some simul streaming in the future. If you want to help enable that, we do have subscriptions for the live streams. Uh, where the next subscription goal is 11 subscribers. At that point, uh, we, will, we will be seriously purchasing and creating a setup with which we can simul stream to TikTok and YouTube to give a proper top-down, better view of what we are doing while playing Magic the Gathering. Mm -hmm. At least that is what the TikTok Live subscription goal says. Anyway. Anywho, uh, this has been episode 46 of the Dungeon Bros Podcast, and we love you very much. In the meantime, peace.